Hey everyone, welcome to my lightning talk, Bridging C++ and Rust. My name is Yash. Um, I work as a Rust developer advocate at Microsoft. Um, and today I'll be walking you through three different ways of bridging the Rust and C++ languages. Um, just as a heads up, I am very much a C++ novice. I have been programming C++ for about a week now. Um, so forgive me if anything's unergonomic, unclear, not the best. Uh, I haven't been doing this for very long. Um, my expertise is more uh, Rust, which I have been doing for half a decade now, longer. Um, I'm also involved in the development of Rust, so that, that's where my strengths lie. Um, C++ not so much, but still, it's, it's important to make the two work together. So let's dive in. All right. So in this talk, we'll briefly cover what Rust is, why it is, then cover some of the syntax and semantics, and then talk about bridging C++ and Rust. I will be assuming you're familiar with C++, but maybe less so with Rust. So Rust is at this point nearly 20 years old, um, but it's only been stable for since 2018, which makes it about eight years now. So it's, it's a pretty recent language, about 10 years or 20 years younger than uh, C++ and 30 or so years younger than C. Um, it was incubated at Mozilla Research in order to help make the Firefox browser parallel because they were trying to do that and it turned out to be very difficult. Um, and they decided a programming language might be a good solution for that. So Rust in a nutshell is a programming language with a very high level type system similar to Haskell or OCaml. It's a Hindley-Milner type system, which means that um, type safety is, is a big thing. But unlike uh, OCaml and Haskell, it uses a C-like interface. Um, so C-like syntax, which, you know, if you've written Java, JavaScript, C, C++, etc., this should be a lot more familiar to you. Um, it's sort of hallmark feature is it provides memory safety without runtime overhead. So it checks uh, memory like moves and borrows and lendings and all these things um, completely at compile time. And it, it compiles it away and it, it leaves you with code that is as fast as C or C++. Um, it also has native C interop. So you can piecemeal replace components that have been written in C today that may be difficult for numerous reasons, say memory sensitive or uh, safety, safety critical sensitive to bugs, perhaps very old, you know, all these things uh, Rust can help you with and you can replace it and you can interop it. That's one of its strengths. So it doesn't try and reinvent the entire world. Instead, it fits into the existing uh, ecosystems and, and systems that people build. It also has uh, very modern like async IO facilities, it has async await notation. Um, this is the, the thing that I help work with. So it makes parallelism easy. It makes concurrent systems easy to write. And it prevents data races, uh, which which is great when you're dealing with multi-threading. Um, so who's using Rust? Many places, uh, including us here at Microsoft, but also it's being used all throughout AWS, Cloudflare, uh, even in kernels. Uh, since this week, it is in the Windows 11 Insider build uh, inside of the kernel, but it's also being introduced inside of Linux. And I believe Android has components such as their Bluetooth stack which they have uh, rewritten, in, rewritten in Rust um, for its, its performance and safety, safety aspects. So that's it for what Rust is. Now let's take a look at Rust itself. Um, here's a little cheat sheet for syntax. We use the FN keyword for functions. We uh, use a little, little arrow to return types. A name colon type uh, notation for, for names and types. Uh, kind of like, um, I believe TypeScript does it this way. And then you can declare um, methods on structs using impl blocks. Um, that's that's the syntax. Um, the semantics are maybe a bit more interesting here, where by default, all uh, Rust values are by move, which is move semantics in C++, although we don't support move constructors, but that's a whole thing. Um, and we, we have uh, two types of references as well which is uh, unique and shared references. Um, a unique reference can be mutated. A shared reference can only be read, and you can only either have a single unique reference or multiple uh, shared references, but, but never both at the same time. And th this is compile time enforced, and th this is what allows Rust to be memory safe um, with, without runtime overhead. 
So here, here's the way you define a struct in Rust, which is a struct with a name and then members inside of it. So na key, like name type pairs. Um, here's how you define functions in Rust. In this case, uh, it returns a zero sized unit type. Uh, Rust is also entirely expression-based. So, you know, it, it evaluates the unit expression here. Um, and this, this just prints me out to standard out. And then here's how you implement methods. First, we have a getter uh, for the, the, the type name, which uh, takes self by reference, so a shared reference, and returns a string slice. And then we have a setter, which takes a new string and that mutates self. So you can see that the self parameter, which is like C++ is this, but inside of the argument list, it says, hey, we need a mutable reference to self because we're going to update a value here. Okay. So to dive into binding C++ and Rust entirely by hand. The, the first one is we're going to uh, take Rust and C++, make them both talk uh, C ABI to each other, and then link them together, and that just works. That is maximally flexible, but it, it is kind of inconvenient because both Rust and C++, we like our smart pointers, we like our abstractions, and if you're going to C ABI, um, you don't get access to all of that. So you, you need to oftentimes wrap it in code, which is a bit difficult, but you know, it works and that is pretty great. So let's take a look at that. Here we have our cat's HPP file, which is a, a struct cat. It has a name and it has a bool, whether it's hungry or not. Then we can construct our cat. We can get the cat name. We can feed our cat and we can make our cat meow. Now here's the implementation. Uh, if our cat has not been fed, it will uh, meow, I'm hungry. And if it has been fed, it will meow, I'm sleepy. So, yep. Then on the Rust side of this, that, that was our C++ code on the Rust side of this, we'll, we'll be reusing this example everywhere. So, you know, we, we just go through it like once. Um, on, on the Rust side of this, we have a buildRS file, which is like a make file, but native to the Rust toolchain, um, where we invoke the, the CMake file, uh, or this, sorry, the CMake library to, to use CMake to build the, the, the C++ code. Then we say, hey, please build this C++ code. And it builds it. And then I haven't printed the invocations here, but there's ways of saying like, okay, and then please also link it as part of the build. Um, the full example, which I'll link at the end, includes all of this so you can like go through and browse it yourself. Then the Rust code itself, it redeclares the same struct. It says, hey, this struct is not wrapper Rust, it is wrapper C, so please use C ABI. And then we create FFI bindings for all of the methods inside of an extern C block. Um, and that gives us access. And then we can invoke this using all of this, which is just C methods and raw pointers. Um, the, these are not compiler checked, by the way. So unsafe blocks mean uh, you're on the hook for validating that the semantics hold. Um, but you still need to uphold the exact same Rust semantics. You, you don't get to not uphold them. It's just sometimes you, you like with FFI, uh, the compiler cannot check it for you. So you have to check it yourself. This is pretty rare. It's only at the FFI boundaries and for some primitives that this needs to be done. Um, but yeah, here we're doing FFI stuff. So uh, we take our cat, we create our cat, and then we call meow, then we call feed, and we call meow again, and that just works. Um, okay, intermediate level. Rather than needing to, like we saw here, uh, redeclare the struct, and also here, you know, earlier, have the multiple definitions, um, what we can do instead is use a tool called bindgen, which will read the header files from C++ and auto-generate Rust bindings. We can then use that to call things and it will just be less work. So here is again, our cats.hpp file. Um, in this case, we no longer need to use struct because we're not using extern C anymore. We are just using native C++ classes. Um, so here's our class with all the methods like earlier, but in class form. And then we um, create the implementation there, still same logic. But then in the Rust build file, we do something different. Namely, we call the bind gen tool to generate our bindings. And then we build a C++ code and then it gets linked and the bindings get generated. And then in our main file, we can take those bindings and um, just use those. So rather than doing the free functions like we saw earlier, we can now see that our cat has methods on it. 
So we can call cat.meow and cat.feed, which is a lot more convenient. So bindgen is great when you can use it. I uh, highly recommend using it. There's also the inverse tool called cbindgen if you want to create Rust, um, take Rust and like create C binding C headers for it. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. So for the final example, what if we wanted to go like all the way through? Um, so far, we've been seeing uh, things like car star, uh, char star strings. Um, but Rust and C++ both have access to native strings like high-level string representations, which are nicer to use, other types such as smart pointers. Um, and the CXX library allows you to, to create a, a bridge between the two using these high-level types. So it is aware of Rust and C++ libraries, and it, it makes sure that those like er, like ergonom you can create ergonomic like bridging between the two. So uh, in this example, what we'll be doing is we'll be round tripping. So we create a definition in Rust, call that from C++, and then export a function again from uh, to Rust, which we then invoke. So our header now is just a void function test. We just gave it a something name, doesn't matter, because th this is what we'll be using from Rust. Then in our uh, implementation, uh, test calls our Rust types. Here we say, hey, please uh, create a cat and then call meow and feed again. Um, unfortunately, CXX is not yet aware of how constructors work. So this is a free function to create our, our struct or our class. Um, but then from there, it's, it's you know, the, the methods do work. In order to build it, what we can do is we can use the CXX build um, library. We can give it some flags and that just works. Now on the Rust side, rather than defining the, the types on the C side, or sorry, on the C++ side, um, we're now doing it on the Rust side. And we say, hey, extern Rust within this like CXX bridge construction, we say, hey, here's an extern Rust block with all the methods and a shared struct named cat with um, a name and is hungry. And then importing from C++, we say, hey, there's a function called test that we would like to have access to. And then the actual implementation, so those were the headers, the actual implementation here is like we have Neocat, which implements all logic, and it's it's pretty much the same logic. Rust and C++ look, look pretty similar in, in many cases. Um, so yeah, the, the only thing that probably stands out here is that Fee takes a mutable reference to self because it mutates, it uh, updates the is hungry field. Everything else takes a shared reference. And then here we call FFI test, which invokes the C++ code. And that works. Um, okay, just the, the final bits here. Um, there are more options that you can investigate if you're interested. Uh, CXX can be combined with bindgen to make things more convenient. I unfortunately uh, ran out of time to try it as well. As I said, I've only been doing this for a week. Um, the Google Auto CXX project, which is an unofficial project, um, takes both libraries and is intended to make that more convenient. I have also not tried it, but I, I really like the premise of that because I found myself needing, when using CXX, which is what you would want to be using if you could, um, there's some repetition involved, but auto CXX removes that repetition, which seems very promising. There's also CXX async, which adds support for async types. And finally, C bind gen, as mentioned earlier, if you want to uh, create, um, like wrap Rust code into like uh, C headers and make that, like automate that project. Um, yes. So in conclusion, Rust is a memory safe programming language. It has native interop with C. And with, with some use of tooling, you can also make it interop with C++. Those tools are being actively developed and they're improving um, all the time. So hopefully this will become easier over time. And I'm very excited for where this is going. I hope this was useful. Um, if you're interested in seeing these examples, trying them out, building them yourself, you can go to this URL on GitHub where uh, you can find all three examples checked in and my slides as well. So you can read those over if you want to. Thank you so much.